This third and final demonstration will be one of the most exciting demonstrations of the entire series, perhaps the most exciting demonstration you've seen from Keysight. Here we're going to use the new XSB source as a modulated source. We're introducing for the first time the modulation capability in the DDS synthesizer. For those of you who saw part three, Meet the Designers, we hinted at this capability. It's now available as option S93072B. We're gonna create 16 and 64 QAM, 400 mega symbol per second modulated signals out of source three. We'll put those into the frequency converter and then we'll measure the ACPR and the EVM, both on the PNA and on the UXA spectrum analyzer and compare the results. For this last demonstration of distortion on frequency converters, we're going to use a new measurement application you may not have seen before. This is called the modulation distortion on converters application. We've uh, had some uh, videos uh, previously on the modulation distortion, but this is applied to frequency converters. So let's take a look at how this is set up. In the modulation distortion for frequency converters, we apply a modulated source to the device under test through a frequency, and that'll be the frequency converter. And then in the RF path, we have to describe what we have. So we're gonna have a modulated source at the input, and then we can apply some attenuation. If we had attenuation at the input, it'll allow us to couple off a reference signal that's larger for devices that need very low drive level. The device is a mixer under test, and if we want, we can pre-put in the gain values, but we don't need to. I'm gonna be measuring it with the signal coming out of port one and going into port two. In my RF path configurator, I don't show the third source here, but in fact, for the first time, I'm going to show using the PNA built-in XSB source, that's the source that comes out the rear panel, uh, using its built-in modulation capabilities. The modulation capabilities allow to, allows me to do a wide band modulated signal and I will put that in the J10 port, so that's why the combiner switch. So the modulated signal will come out of port one and will go into port two, passing through the frequency converter. In addition, I'm going to use the uh, mixer setup tab to set the local oscillator. So in this case, my input signal is gonna be five gigahertz. The output signal is gonna be 28 gigahertz is what I uh, desire for my output signal. And I'm gonna use an LO from port three of 23 gigahertz. This is very similar to the two-tone setup I had before, but now I'm using the source three. In the modulate tab is where we describe how we modulate the signal. So source three is the source I've chosen as the modulation source. And uh, I can generate my own modulation files which are things like flat tones or NPR. But in this case, I wanna use something like a 16 QAM modulation file. I'm using a tool called IQ Tools that you can get from Keysight. And this tool allows me to define my modulation, digital modulations. The sample rate of the modulation source has to be 19.2 uh, giga samples divided by uh, M over N. So you can have for example, 2.4 uh, giga samples per second. The symbol rate, we have a lot of flexibility on the symbol rate and the number of symbols, but two, um, there are two limitations. One limitation is the number of samples has to be divisible by 32. And the second limitation is you can't have a waveform longer than about 6.2 microseconds. The actual number is, two to the 17th samples at 19.2 gigasamples per second. And so uh, we can take the sample rate and take the number of samples divided by the sample rate. That has to be less than about 6.2 uh, microseconds. So in this case, it's exactly six microseconds. I can take this file and I can save the waveform as a CSV file. And then I can load that CSV file directly here. The only thing we have to do to modify the CSV file is we have to add one line at the top, and that line is sample rate. Here you can see I've opened the file, and you see I only need to add the single line sample rate equals 2.4 E9. That's enough information for the PNA to know exactly how to download this into its internal source.
And finally, the measure tab is where we get to choose what kind of measurements we want to do. I've chosen to do both ACPR measurements and EVM measurements. You can do just band power. You might do that if you're doing uh, just looking for modulated gain. We allow you to do NPR. And multiband can be chosen if you want to do something like a multi-carrier EVM and you want to find the EVM of the individual carriers. But we're going to stick with ACP plus EVM. We can autofill these uh, bandwidths or we can go back in and manually adjust them. So I've adjusted this for the channel bandwidth I want and the ACP low and high offsets. You can see this sweeping in the background with the power off and it says we have 100% EVM and 0 dBc ACPR, which we expect because there's no signal. So all we're, all we're seeing is noise. And over here, I've set up a spectrum analyzer. We'll take a sweep with that. This is a UXA spectrum analyzer, and again, it shows no signal. And interestingly, it shows 38% uh, EVM, so it's not 100%. And that's because it's still interpreting these uh, symbol points as uh, close to a, a constellation point, even though there is no uh, signal there. Now let's turn on the RF power and we'll watch the sweep acquire. It takes a little bit of time to download the waveform and acquire the sweep. And we can see here I've got three traces. This blue trace is the output power trace and we can see the ACP. The yellow trace is the input trace to the uh, frequency converter. So the input trace is sitting at five gigahertz. The output trace is being measured at 28 gigahertz. And in the table below, we can see the table values. I'm driving it at minus 20 dBm. It's got about 7.5 dB of gain. And the EVM we measure here is about 2.6%. We also measure the ACPR. Uh, the green trace is the ACP power. That's the, uh, not the ratio, but the actual power in the band. So we can see the center band, which measures the power in the uh, signal is around minus 12 dBm. It's the same as the carrier output power. And the ACP powers are 48 and 49, which uh, represents a minus 36 dBc um, and almost minus 37 dBc ACPR. So here we can see that we are doing a, a distortion characterization using ACP as the reference measure. And we also can show you the ACP of the input signal because sometimes the source input signal can generate its own ACPR. So I see 2.6% EVM. Let's see how close that is to what we measure using the UXA. So if we jump to the UXA, I've turned it on to sweep. We can see the 16 qualm signal that we're using and it's showing very close to the 2.6 number. Sometimes I like to add a little averaging so we can go to the setting, turn averaging on, and that'll allow us to settle down that number. So it's very close to the same number we see for the measurement on the PNA. And this is very typical. We get within about 0.1% when noise doesn't limit the measurements. Let's pause this measurement. I often get asked what are the limitations on the measurements in here. Uh, one of the limitations is the effective noise bandwidth. Because we're comparing the input signal to the output signal and we're using a correlation method to understand the EVM, and it turns out you can show mathematically this is exactly equivalent to the demodulation method in terms of the number it returns. But uh, noise can limit our measurement, so I can make the measurement faster by going to a 3 kilohertz equivalent noise bandwidth, but you can see now my EVM is sitting at 3%. The 3% EVM is caused by noise on the input signal, which is lower than the output signal, and it could even be caused by noise on the output signal as well. So that uh, this allows us to trade off measurement speed for um, EVM noise floor. So here I'll choose around 600 uh, hertz, and it turns out the exact bandwidth is limited by the uh, waveform length, and so uh, we will find the closest resolution bandwidth or equivalent noise bandwidth that fits the waveform that we're measuring. And we can see that if I go a lot lower, let's go down to 100 hertz equivalent noise bandwidth, the measurement time is greatly increased, 
but the EVM number doesn't decrease very much. This is a clear indication that we're now measuring the true EVM of the device under test and our systematic noise is not a contributor. Now let's see what happens when I change the carrier power. Let's take the carrier power up to minus 15 dBm. You can see that the uh, data clears and then it shows, oh, we're running about 7% EVM. Let's go over to the spectrum analyzer and we'll restart the measurement. Now it says it's overloading, so we have to go to the optimize EVM button and the optimize EVM should clear the overload and give us the optimum result. And we can see indeed it's running right at about 7% as well. Slightly under, but just about 7%. So we can see that um, at these moderate levels of EVM, we see identical results between the PNA and the UXA with the traditional demodulation. Finally, let's see how low I can go. I've reset the power level to minus 30 dBm, and we're still seeing about 2.5%, but I can see that the uh, noise floor on the input, the ACP is 33, which is about a 3% noise floor, maybe a little less. So one of the things we can do is we can adjust the source attenuator in the RF path. By adding 10 dB attenuation, it makes the source signal 10 dB higher before the reference receiver, but at the device under test, it's still going to be the minus 30 dBm. And that will lower the noise floor of the input signal. So now we're seeing we're running around 0.97% EVM. We might lower that a bit more by narrowing the noise bandwidth. And we can also come over to the uh, UXA measurement. Again, it's reading 2%, but we'll re-optimize the EVM. And after its optimization, it gets down to about 1.7% EVM. I don't think there's anything more we can do to reduce the EVM here. I think we're limited by the noise floor of the uh, spectrum analyzer in this case. Back on the PNA measurement, we see the EVM is around 0.75% with this narrower bandwidth. We would expect the EVM to become uh, essentially go to zero if the device is completely linear. The final thing I'm going to show is what happens when we go to higher modulation formats. Here I've gone back to the modulate key. I have a 64 qualm signal. So let's recall that 64 qualm signal and see what we see. Just for fun, let's turn the RF power off and take a quick measurement on the UXA. Notice now it shows 20% EVM instead of 40% EVM. The higher the density of the QAM, the smaller the EVM error will read when there's no signal because the spacings between the constellation points are closer and the maximum EVM that you can get is one constellation point away. Let's turn the RF power on, take a sweep, and look at the signal coming out at 16 qualm, or 64 qualm. Here after the equalizer runs, we get down around 3.3% EVM for 64 qualm at this power level, minus 12 dBm output. And again, the same power level, the same EVM shows up on the PNA. Let's go to a higher power level now. Let's take the power level up to minus 10. And to get that power level, we may have to re remove the attenuator from the RF path. and take a sweep. And over here, we'll have to re-optimize the EVM on the UXA to make sure it's not overdriven. And at this drive level, we're quite uh, in compression, and so we can't really demodulate at this drive level, and it's finding a maximum of 13% EVM. It won't ever show a, low, a higher EVM than 13% with this kind of signal because the uh, best case demodulation will uh, always find a symbol point within that 13%. Here we see we're looking at about a 15% EVM, which corresponds well with the ACP that we see here of a 20 dBc ACP. So we don't have the limitation of uh, having to demodulate the signal, so we can read very high values of EVM if you ever had an interest in doing that.
And finally, let's change our carrier power to minus 25 dBm on the 64 qualm signal. We can see if we do a continuous sweep, it'll keep updating. We're seeing about 1.15% EVM. And if we look over here on the UXA, it's showing about 1.4% EVM. We'll try and optimize and see if we can improve it any more. But I think that's about the limit. Oh, yeah, a little more. So we're, we're getting down to around 1.3% EVM measure on the UXA and 1.15% EVM on the PNA. So you can see that we correspond really well in our uh, EVM measurements. I didn't show the ACPR measurements on the UXA, but our numbers will correspond almost exactly on the ACPR within a half dB or less. So that concludes our final demonstration. I know it was a bit long, but uh, this new and exciting capability of doing direct EVM measurements on the PNA using the built-in modulated source is something I thought um, everyone would want to see. And if you have any more questions on uh, the internal modulated source, what its capabilities are, send us a note. We might set up another um, uh, webinar that describes just the modulation distortion by itself and how you can set up your modulated source. Thank you very much.